for the classification task. Um, I hope everybody had a wonderful week. So for this week's agenda, what I'll be going through is an important component to any natural language task, which is real, uh, which is word embedding. Uh, we'll kind of cover what it is, some statistical approaches, uh, some that we've already encountered in, from last week. Um, Sorry, this, uh, and then we'll go over the language model. Again, what that is, um, how this kind of uh, applies to word embedding and word representation. And we'll look at specifically word to vec this week. There are some other ones, uh, language model that I'll also discuss, but primarily we'll be focusing on word to vec this week. Um, and then lastly, we'll kind of take a look at uh, the vector space representation and kind of get a sense of an ideal vector space, uh, what an ideal vector space representation may look like. So, uh, sorry, was there a question? No, okay. So for the learning objective for this week is uh, really to understand and apply word embedding and to deep learning models, um, apply language models for semantic vector representation, um, and then train and explore word to vec using uh, GenSim library. So what is word embedding? So in the diagram I have here, if we have a deep neural network, and we try to feed in uh, some form of natural language, which is often in the form of text. Now, if we recall, the deep neural network is a network that contains neurons with some connections. So those neurons are actually, what they're doing is performing matrix operations. So if we feed in a raw text image, a raw text to the neural network, a neural network is unable to identify how to process that uh, uh, natural language, uh, primarily, primarily from the fact that um, matrix, multi matrix operations cannot be performed on text. So this is where this concept of word embedding comes from, where we take the text, we put it through what we call an encoder, and what that encoder does is converts the raw text into some vector representation of it, um, we are, which we call, which lies within some vector uh, space. So with that vector space representation, now that's, uh, that our input is in the form of a vector, um, matrix multiplication, matrix op operations can now be performed within the deep neural network, which can generate a prediction and essentially perform back propagation to actually learn ideal weights for a specific problem task. Now, formally, uh, we can define word embedding as a set of transformation techniques that really map words or documents to a vector space as what was depicted in the image before, where we had the raw text going into an encoder, so that would be our transformation technique that outputs some vector which is, uh, has some representation towards it. Now, there's different types of word embedding. Uh, approaches. Uh, the most uh, most straightforward approach would be a one-hot encoding. What a hot one encoding is is within the image to the side. So ideally you have a vector where uh, a very sparse vector with all its entries zero aside from one entry. Oftentimes this could be in association when we're doing word uh, word one hot encoding where each dimension in this vector represents an actual word and the one is indicate where the one is indicating that specific word so 
the one hot encoding is not only applicable in NLP, but primarily how we represent categorical information. So if we treat uh, the vocabulary within our corpus as categorical, uh, then we can represent each word in our data as a one hot encoding. Uh, another type of word embedding is bag of words encoding. We saw this in prior and last week's session when we were counting the number of frequencies uh, within the sentence. This is essentially what a bag of words is, where we put in all the words in there w within our document, and we there is no semantical, uh, syntactical, or semantical ordering towards our representation. It just provides uh, indication of the most frequent word uh, within our document. Uh, another. Um, Another type of encoding that we brushed off a little bit on last week was a term frequency inverse document frequency encoding, which looks at uh, addressing um, some bias towards uh, the bag of words encoding, where highly frequent words such as stop words, the, ah, uh, and uh, they can provide heavily, they can provide with, in bag of words, they provide heavy influence on the representation. However, when it comes to the actual uh, NLP tests, such as um, distinguishing between different documents, uh, they provide little value in uh, distinguishing documents based off just the count itself. So really, uh, the, the term frequency inverse documentation addresses this problem by uh, providing a weighting scale such that highly frequent words within the whole corpus uh, provides not as, not as powerful weights, whereas um, words that are highly frequent within a specific document, but not so frequent within the whole corpus itself, again, provides a large value in representation. Now, latent semantic analysis encoding is a type of encoding that kind of stems from um, bag of words as well as term frequency inverse document uh, frequency encoding where uh, those essentially looks at co-occurrences of words within the documentation. However, um, as we saw in last week's, our vocabulary size can get quite large. And if we have a large number of documents, our matrix to maintain that information will be n by n, where n is the number of uh, the size of our vocabulary, and n would be the number of our, our documents. So if we have a large vocabulary as well as a large, uh, l large number of documents, our matrix is very large and will require a large amount of memory, um, memory uh, to maintain that information. So what latent semantic analysis does is take that uh, co-occurrence matrix of those terms when, within those documents and tries to reduce the dimensionality of it uh, using uh, singular decomposition. Uh, and finally, the last one that uh, is highly popular currently right now is, for word embedding is using language models. Uh, language models. Uh, so we'll, we'll review what language model are coming up uh, and we'll kind of get a sense why it's used in uh, highly popular in current state of the art uh, systems. So language model. So language model is essentially a model that learns to predict the next word of a phrase. So uh, uh, a very easy type of application where language models is, has been uh, initially used is autocomplete uh, sentences where if you type in, uh, start typing in uh, your sentence, uh, Language model is commonly applied to uh, speed up the process and, and typically guess what word or essentially um, 
it, we got in a current autocomplete is a bit more advanced now that it actually goes ahead and tries to complete uh, the remaining phases, not just words. So um, how can language models uh, predict next words? Well, there's two key things that a language needs to uh, have in order to be able to predict uh, next words. One is linguistics and as well as domain knowledge. Uh, linguistics is uh, straightforward in the fact that uh, linguistics will kind of dictate what the next word should be in terms of the part of speech. It, it, there is a lot of uh, linguistics rules when it comes to writing where um, uh, adverb comes for verbs and so forth and so section. So those type of syntactical rules uh, apply to language models uh, as well as domain knowledge. Uh, now domain knowledge is a bit harder for, to, for a model to learn in the fact that really domain knowledge uh, uh, will dictate the type of word that will be used. Now I provided two examples here where the first one uh, at the top, if we look at both phrases, uh, starting of both phrases, we have people in Canada speak and people in Korea speak. With a language model that provides no domain knowledge, this is very difficult in uh, providing this answer in the fact that uh, linguistically, the, this could be any type of language. Uh, however, uh, with the domain knowledge, uh, this can, uh, with domain knowledge, this can be filtered out further in the fact that um, uh, with the knowledge sets, uh, if the language model has this specific domain knowledge, it knows that the most probable word for the first sentence, people in Canada speak, is English. So, uh, sorry about that. Uh, and the second part would be people in Korea speak. Now, um, again, uh, with domain knowledge, the uh, a language model is able to filter this out to be Korean. Uh, and uh, again, uh, another example at the bottom where we have, I want to eat a hot dog uh, with domain knowledge, uh, with domain knowledge, dog would be the most, uh, probable choice, whereas in the second option, uh, uh, the forecast is a uh, hot, again, dog wouldn't make sense here if domain knowledge uh, was viable in the language model, where uh, the more probable choice would be a day. So the forecast is a hot day. So, uh, now, the different types of methods that uh, that is used in language model, the first being the traditional engram. So you may have heard uh, this term engram used um, in NLP if you've uh, looked at NLP prior. Engram is really the notion of the pairings of uh, the vocabulary space. So we have binary where it's a single word, uh, sorry, uni, uh, unigram, which is singular uh, word, a binary gram, which would be two pairs of words, and a trigram, uh, which would be a three, uh, a combination of three words. Um, and then you, uh, you can go to four or five. Um, in, in most cases, uh, as you increase uh, the number of grams uh, when performing traditional n-grams, your language model at your language model performs better at predicting uh, the next word. In the fact that it has more data, uh, more more granular data to work with when working out the statistical occurrences. Uh, however, there is a trade-off in traditional n-grams when working with uh, uh, those larger magnitudes of n-values. In the, in the computational 
uh, component in the computational part where the larger uh, n value gets for n grams, uh, the more time it takes to actually calculate and train uh, the language model. Now, the way a traditional n-gram works is, uh, depending on your granularity of n-gram that you select, um, the vocabulary would be partitioned based off those n-grams. Uh, so your vocabulary would be partitioned based off those n-grams, um, and then it uses uh, probability to calculate the probability of the word given uh, uh, the passwords and it calculates that using uh, the occurrences of those words within your corpus. So it goes through your corpus and tries to identify how many instances of let's say word one and word two uh, work together uh, to in the notion of predicting word three. So those statistical measurements are calculated based off of your data um, and those would be dependent on the end value as well. Now, word to vec, which would we cover in uh, today's section more, um, looks at uh, using um, neural networks to predict um, to predict the word given uh, the prior words. Um, so, and. Uh, we'll look into more detail of how that is actually accomplished uh, in the following slides. Uh, and then there's fast text and glove. Um, the reason why we're not going to cover fast text and glove in this session is it's very similar to word to vec. Uh, the primary difference is again uh, the creators, where word to vec is from Google um, and uh, fast text is from base books and glove is at Stanford. Um, word to vec it has been selected for this workshop primarily is it's the more popular one in the fact that um, fast text and glove um, are were created in 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 uh, based off of the word to vec architecture uh, addressing some of its limitations. Uh, some key difference regarding fast text to word to vec is the fact that word to vec uh, as the main indicates works on the word level, fast text works on the character level, and then glove works on the word level. However, um, uh, what glove does is adds an additional component where it actually provides some global information um, where it's uh, during training, it has information regarding some global co occurrences of the words. Sorry, was there a question? Oh, hi. Can I ask hi. a question? Yeah. Um, so, in the uh, word embedding models or approaches that you mentioned, uh, yeah. I assume that none of them does any a special coding, right? Um, can you elaborate more when you say special? Yeah, so, coding? yes, yeah. because like in case that we want to use a CNN deep neural network in yes. our model, right? So yes. we need some kind of a spatial coding to be embedded in, into our input if I'm not mistaken. So I asked Yes, you so that's, that's a little bit different where um, I can, I do not cover um, the utilization of CNN within this workshop, uh, primarily due to the fact that um, um, more, most of the state of the art performance is conducted through RNN, which naturally treats um, text better in the fact that RNN um, works at more from the temporal, temporal representation of the input data, where, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, CNN works on the spatial. However, uh, there is, you can use CNN um, regarding uh, NLP. However, CNN is not dynamic in handling um, uh, uh, the dynamic size of uh, NLP. Given that, uh, so oftentimes when you work with CNN, um, we, we, we 
pre-process our image input to be of the same uh, resolutional dimension, mm -hmm. uh, which is often, it's, which is very sim uh, simple in uh, imaging where we can act, where if we reduce the dimensionality of the resolution, there are techniques uh, such that, uh, that, such that uh, a lot, many uh, such that the data loss isn't significant uh, too significant where in nlp um uh, it's a little bit difficult um trans uh translating all the uh, all our document sizes to of uniform size um where oftentimes we will be we might be injecting noise or uh, reducing some valuable information um, however, if you are interested, um, you can send me an email uh, and then I can provide you some references regarding um, applying a CNN to uh, NLP problems. Uh, but no, there is no specific type of word encoding, the ones that I specifically mentioned, um, that, is, uh, that will convert it to some uh, spatial image representation. Great. Thank you. I will okay. follow up uh, with you with an email. Okay. Thanks. Um, so word to vec um, the, as I mentioned, what it does is it utilizes a, a neural network based model where it, the task is provided some input, um, provided some words, predict what the next word is. Um, however, there is two modes when it comes to word to vec. The first uh, one is the continuous block of words, which was first introduced, which, um, which, which has the input of the surrounding words. So if we look at here in the image provided, um, we provide as input the 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 prior word uh, the pr two prior words uh, one being uh, direct uh, one back from the current word and then two back from the current word as well as providing uh, uh, the neighboring future word um, as well as the neighboring uh, future future word and we try to predict uh, the middle uh, word, uh, the middle word. Uh, so that is the uh, continuous block of words. Um, however, using this approach, they, 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 there was, uh, the performance wasn't as high when it came to uh, larger data as well as data uh, as well as, sorry, it, it didn't perform as well uh, with uh, lower data, as well as um, it struggled when it came to data sets where there was, uh, it, it had, it struggled with representing uh, less frequent words. Uh, that's where they introduced the skip gram approach where uh, they took the output um, and put it in the input and put the input in the output. So in th this instance, they provide the input as the middle term and they try, try to predu uh, predict um, the prior words, the previous words, as well as the next two future words. Now, um, there is a bit of trade-off in these two where, as I mentioned, in the skip gram approach, in the script gram approach, um, it, it handled the frequency of words uh, a bit better, uh, a lot better than the continuous block of words. However, there is a trade off with this performance in the fact that um, the script gram is less uh, efficient in memory, um, where the continuous bag of words uh, works a lot better with uh, RAM efficiency. So now let's have a look at the vector space representation. So what we're going to do is uh, kind of get an understanding of 
what type of vector space representation uh, after after learning this word embedding what what type of vector space um, we are trying to achieve so I'm going to use the um, very popular um, uh, analogy when it comes to the vector space representation, which is the king, queen, man, woman analogy. And um, I provided a little diagram here in, uh, imagine this is uh, the vector space represented in two dimensional. We have the x-axis and the y-axis. And we're trying to understand if this is a good representation space. So again, um, since we're working in the vector space, we want to see if um, our metric operations uh, make logical connections when it comes to semantics. So if we take an example right here, um, where if we try to uh, perform this operation where we say king minus prince plus, plus princess equals, um, if we try to calculate what this arithmetic operation in this vector space will equal to, the resulting of this should also make sense semantically. So if we work this out, if we do king minus prince, um, we start off in uh, this king uh, location and we subtract it based off of the prince vector. So we move backwards and down. Then from that position, if we add the princess um, vector, uh, again, from that location, we move more to the right and uh, up. Now, where we end up is actually where our uh, vector representation for queen was. So, uh, so uh, this is so semantically uh, this arithmetic oper this arithmetic operation um, semantically makes sense. Where if we have a king, we subtract it by the prince, add a princess. Uh, semantically, this makes sense in the fact that we'll end up with a queen. Now, if we take a look at those relationships between a prince, a princess, a king, and a queen, um, we kind of see in the semantical space that they have very similar uh, distances between each other. They have similar, a queen and queen has a similar relationship as does a prince and a princess. Uh, we also see a similar uh, relationship between a princess and a queen to a prince, uh, from a prince to a king. So if we look further into this, we actually see, um, we can kind of infer some uh, representation where from a given location, if we move more left, this is indicating semantically that our word is becoming more feminine. Where if we're, uh, moving up from our current location in this vector space, uh, it's, it's representing a, a, a word of higher status. So we can kind of fill in our uh, coordinate system where uh, the x-axis may be something that's representing uh, the gender of the word, where the y-axis is representing um, the hierarchy of the word. So this is a good representation in the fact that um, the vector space, when we uh, perform um, operations within this vector space, they line up with um, semantical uh, relationships. Um, so uh, that's uh, the end of uh, the the tutorial portion, uh, does anybody have any questions regarding uh, the presentation? Uh, 
Uh, there's one question in the chat, and that is, what is the dimension of vector space, and what are the basis vectors? Okay. Um, so the dimension uh, size of the vector space um, would depend on the type of algorithm that you use, as well as uh, the type of hyperparameters that you use. So if we look at the of uh, algorithms that I laid out. So if we were to look at the one-hot encoding, the, vec the dimension of the vector space uh, for one-hot encoding would be, as well as bag of words, um, would, be, uh, would be the size of our vocabulary. So if in our data sets, we only have, let's say in the example given here, if we only have five possible words, our, our dimension space for our vector uh, representation would be five. Uh, and then what is, are the basis vectors? Uh, sorry, can you elaborate further when you, what you're asking regarding basis vectors? Uh, I think I got your point. Uh, my my uh, my point was, uh, for example, in two uh, in two dimension you have uh, hierarchy and uh, I think the gender. But yes. I mean, in a general case, uh, if you want to represent a vector, uh, uh, it's it, a huge. Yeah. Yeah. So in general case, um, it, it, again, it's in a high high. Once once we go beyond uh, three uh, the third dimensions. Um, we are unable to comprehend uh, past the third dimension. So it's really hard to interpret once we go beyond those realms. Um, however, uh, there are techniques that you can use uh, for visualization of it. However, it's really subjective in the fact that it's a lot of analysis where you're looking at relationships of the, your vector space that it, uh, the, ve the vectors that are generated by your language model or your word embedding and trying to uh, group them together um, and kind of place them within a two-dimensional space um, and trying to um, identify relationships through that way. So uh, you can kind of identify uh, some relationships. However, you wouldn't I ideally know which of uh, elements within the vector that's representing because once we once you do those type of analysis uh, you are uh, essentially bringing your high dimensional vector space in a two dimensional space so we can interpret it so a lot of it, uh, a lot of the information is lost there thank you yeah uh, any other questions Okay, uh, if there's no other questions, um, I propose we take a five minute break and then uh, I'll go uh, towards the application uh, examples afterwards. So I currently have 6.45. Um, let's say we reconvene at 6.10. Hi everyone, so I hope everybody is back now. Uh, so for this uh, week's uh, application example, um, I thought I, I decided to change it up slightly um, in the fact that um, rather than using Google Colab, uh, I decided to use the Kaggle Notebook. Uh, just so if anybody was interested in uh, or preferred to use uh, to prefer to use uh, Kaggle's notebook in the future, uh, I thought I'd cover it in at least one of the sessions. So let's go ahead and share my screen. 
So um, as I mentioned this week's session, we will be using uh, Kaggle's notebook. Um, so if we jump over to Kaggle, um, what, if you recall in the prior session, I mentioned that uh, Kaggle isn't only very good when it comes to publicly available data sets as well as uh, competitions. It's an, a wonderful resource uh, to learn uh, a variety of data science techniques, uh, data science coding, uh, machine uh, varying from machine learning to deep learning, as well as varying between uh, different uh, machine learning tasks from computer visions to NLP uh, to numerical analysis. So uh, one key resource for uh, learning when it comes to Kaggle is uh, publicly available notebooks. So for this week's application coding, uh, we're actually going to take a look at um, an existing publicly available notebook and kind of run through it together. So uh, the notebook that we'll be going through is uh, word to vec specifically on implementation of word to vec using Jensen. So through the Kaggle uh, UI, uh, you can go to notebooks and we can filter just to have Python and search for Jensen. So the specific one that we'll be looking at is actually this one right here, um, the number one recommended one, which is Jensen Work to Vec Tutorial. So click on that. This gives us a notebook, provides it in, provides uh, details of it. But the great thing about Kaggle and these notebooks is you can actually, there's a button at the top right to actually, um, well, actually I already made a copy of it. Uh, however, it is, if you have it already, you should say uh, copy and edit. So you can actually make a version of uh, this notebook. Um, uh, as, as a side note, uh, for anybody uh, that, uh, does not want to go and uh, use the Kaggle notebook where uh, they have no intention of using it in the future uh, and uh, is very comfortable with the Google Colab environments. Uh, I also uh, uploaded uh, the file in the GitHub repository, uh, taking that notebook and converting it to uh, a version that will be supported in Google Colab. So that is also an option for anybody that's interested. So if I jump over to my own notebook. So I have my version. So Once you open the notebook, it takes a bit of time to load everything. So now my session has started. Uh, for this specific session, uh, since we're not doing any uh, deep learning with PyTorch. Um, we don't need any GPU usage. So if you, um, what I recommend is if you're working with any notebooks that does not require an accelerator, uh, you may want to uh, remove it for that specific session. Just so that, uh, again, uh, just to recall in Kaggle, uh, the limitation usage is not based off computational usage, but rather by time. So as long as you have it enabled, um, it's counting towards your uh, usage uh, consumption, even if your code doesn't actually uh, utilize 
uh, GPU or uh, the TPU uh, resources. So I, uh, just to give a refresher regarding the Kaggle Notebook, um, it's very similar to Google Colab. Uh, you have your similar menus at the top. Um, however, in uh, Kaggle, um, the file system is all available to you here at the side. Now, uh, for the input, you should have uh, something. You should have this entry of the dialogue lines of the Simpsons. Um, you won't have this specific data sets. Um, however, I just created this, this data set is, uh, this input information is actually created from, uh, from this notebook. And I'll kind of demonstrate um, where this information comes from. Um, I just did this for myself in the fact that certain portions of the code, uh, in, for example, the pre-processing of cleaning up the data, uh, takes up uh, not significant amount of time, but takes up uh, uh, enough time uh, that I felt that uh, instead of us waiting through the process to finish, um, I have gone ahead and um, saved uh, that information uh, so that we can reload it during this session. So um, the great thing about these uh, Google, uh, Kaggle notebooks is uh, they they not only provide, uh, but often provide uh, descriptions. And one thing I would recommend is not only to look at uh, notebook tutorials of specific implementations. However, take a look at um, Kaggle notebooks pertaining to specific competition, especially if the competition is very similar to uh, the problem task that you are currently addressing. Uh, you'll often see in those competitions, notebooks of individuals that competed in the project and have documented their, uh, have documented their uh, their life cycle throughout that competition, outlining the, met, uh, the method that they did, providing code, as well as providing uh, analysis, uh, uh, incremental, providing incremental analysis of, uh, providing incremental analysis of their results and providing some insight into their decision process of what to perform next. Um, so um, that's one approach I would recommend, especially if you're tackling a new uh, challenge uh, with no, with limited prior knowledge. Um, it's it's a very good idea to um, kind of get a sense of uh, what worked for people, especially what's very good is um, uh, oftentimes you would have high ranking uh, individuals that place very highly in the competition um, publish these type of notebooks. So um, towards the, this actual Kago notebook, uh, so information for the Kaggle, which uh, were regarding work to VEC, which we uh, covered during uh, the earlier presentation. So towards the actual coding, so this first block of code right here, sorry, let me zoom up for anybody that cannot see. Uh, please let me know if this is still too small. Okay, so if there's no objections, I think the, si the screen size is fine. So, um, so regarding this first line of code, 
Uh, what we have is the statements that we have. So we import um, pandas as uh, what we've seen prior, as well as um, we, we import Spacey for some pre-processing as well as the regular expression to do some data cleanup. So we execute that cell block. So this is the Panda line of code that we have saw in prior sessions of just loading the data. And so we can actually see, examine what the data looks like. So this data set contains uh, two, uh, two columns. The first column is indication of the individual's name. And the second part is the spoken uh, word that that person uh, specified. So just to provide some background information regarding this data set. So this data set is a dialogue of lines from the Simpsons movie. So if you're not familiar with Simpsons, Simpsons is uh, a cartoon um, that has a, a set of families uh, called uh, by their last name being the Simpsons. And it really takes place in, within their community uh, uh, and their lives within uh, Springfield. Um, so uh, the relevance of the, 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 so it will provide some assistance, some domain knowledge, as I mentioned, when it comes to the language model. Um, and we'll kind of see where that plays in um, when we do some analysis. Um, however, if you're not familiar with uh, uh, the domain of the Simpsons, I'll do my best to kind of explain and provide enough background information to um, so you get in a sense why uh, when we evaluate our uh, word embeddings, uh, why we're kind of seeing those type of results. So this is a command that uh, we've not have, have not seen in uh, so in pandas, there is a, a function called is null. So this is very important actually to do um, when evaluating uh, your data, especially when you're dealing with uh, tabular data or uh, numerical data um, where the data set may not necessarily be complete. So what this command does is it actually goes to look and see if we have any empty entries within our data set. So in this specific example, we actually have quite a few entries where um, the specific character that is talking is missing, as well as in certain uh, entries, um, the actual spoken words is missing. So we need to actually address that, especially when we're going to use this data set uh, to train a language model. So this line of code uh, performs exactly that. Uh, this is conducted through the drop.na. So what this does is it drops any uh, null values and while resetting the index. So if we execute this, um, we see that uh, our data set no longer connect contains no entries. Now, this is uh, some pre-processing uh, that we define here, um, where uh, a little bit different. Sorry, do we have a question? Okay, uh, so if there's no question, I'll continue on. Um, so um, a, this section performs uh, the necessary pre-processing that we've seen in prior sessions. However, in prior sessions, we use the NLTK package. However, this 
a specific individual has decided to use uh, the SPACI package. Um, in terms of this context, um, the performance of the SPACI and NLDK uh, will provide very little um, differences, uh, specifically since we're dealing with English as well as uh, the, the text has been, the, the dialogue within this data set um, is not too dirty in the fact that um, it's, uh, it's pretty well uh, synthetically written. So they do that. Uh, one option that they have decided to exclude is the name entity recognition. Um, and again, um, it's primarily for um, computational efficiency. Uh, as well as when we're working with uh, natural language processing, uh, depending on the specific uh, problem test that you're working with NLP, uh, the pre-processing of parser might not be necessarily in a lot of cases in the fact that, um, especially when it comes to uh, if you're utilizing a deep learning model in the fact that uh, the structure of the data can actually be kept when feeding the information depending on the type of neural network model that we use. And specifically when we go through, uh, when we cover next week's session, um, you'll, you'll get a clear understanding why we don't need parser uh, commonly in pre-processing when it comes to NLP uh, and deep learning in the fact that uh, the synthetical structure of the, the, the synthetical structure of the, the sentence can be maintained uh, using a specific type of architecture and it can be learned through there. Uh, so this is defining some of the process that we saw last week where we were removing uh, non-alphanumerical characters. Sorry, uh, just alpha, uh, alpha characters. Um, so this line of code is actually the line of code that executes the training. Um, so this itself, uh, I am not going to execute uh, in the fact that the cleaning process takes a couple minutes, so um, I will exclude that. Um, and this part just drops uh, the entries, uh, removes the entries before cleaning. So uh, in my case, I will go ahead and reload the data uh, reload the clean data that I saved prior. So if we take a look at it, uh, this is the new data sets um, where in this case, we actually don't need the, the speaker of the dialogue, uh, primarily in the fact that we're just working with uh, generating uh, word uh, representations. Uh, and again, um, so this be useful uh, in your prior works when dealing when if you are presented with a data set that is tab delimited and you're working with pandas to do the cleaning and pre-processing step. Um, if you're working with multiple algorithms and uh, multiple algorithms and the pre-processing and cleaning step is all the same, uh, it may be it may be a good idea uh, to speed up your uh, workflow to just save uh, your pre-processing stages. So the results of your pre-processing stages. So in Pandas, it's very simple where there is a function to CSV and you just provide it the CSV file. Uh, one thing I wanted to note actually when it comes to Kaggle, um, if you're trying to access information uh, in this notebook, uh, from the input, uh, 
if you are receiving that the file is not found and it's actually in your entry, you may be providing the wrong path. So to actually get the path, uh, you can select the specific data set and it actually provides you with the full path name that you can enter within your code. Bring that down. So now this is the portions for uh, uh, the information. Uh, we're going to do a little bit more cleanup in the fact that uh, we're actually going to go ahead and create uh, some bigram terms. Now, uh, this is important in the fact that some words are actually significantly important. Some words are, should actually be treated as a bigram or trigram. And this often comes when it comes to names. So for example, if you're working on a text and it contains uh, locations and those specific locations, if you don't have bigrams, it'll treat them as two separate words when they should actually be treated as one. Uh, so an, an example would be New York. If New York was spelled out as new and then space York, um, where in reality, we actually want it as one word New York. Um, so as well as if we have a full name of an individual where we have their first name and last name, we might actually want to treat that name that as a bigram, those two words put together. So this is actually executing uh, that where we're combining uh, some, uh, we're generating some bigrams um, so that we have uh, those information combined together. And specifically, as I mentioned, we're doing this in this case because again, we have uh, names as well as um, uh, some descriptions of those names, such as Mr. Miss. So we go ahead and create that. Generate our phrases. goes ahead and creates our faces and increases our vocabulary. And we bring that back into our sentences. Uh, now this line, this section of code uh, is just for uh, evaluation, uh, just to make sure that uh, the cleaning process um, actually removes specific stop words. And here, all we're doing is place going through our corpus and counting the, the frequency of each word and or outputting the most frequent words to make sure that um, I'll get in there. Now, this is where we get to the interesting part where we have the Gensum word to vec implementation. So we have the necessary inputs. Now, uh, specifically why I loaded this, uh, I chose this specific uh, method for uh, this specific example in the Kaggle notebook is they actually perform uh, the training of the Gensum um, the same way I, I usually conduct training if I were to, uh, when I need to train a uh, word to vec model from scratch where they actually go ahead and uh, perform it in three stages. The first stage is the initialization of the word to vec model, then building of the vocabulary, and actually training uh, the, the word embeddings. So the first stage that we do is we calculate how many CPUs uh, are available, so we can do parallel uh, processing and uh, speed up the process. So now this is the initialization of the work to vec model. Now this is very important now in the fact that uh, 
This really will dictate uh, some of the performance aspects of the word embedding. Now, what some of the common uh, information that we set up would be the minimum count. So the minimum count would be to determine um, what is acceptable to be included uh, in our vocabulary. So if in most cases we don't want to include uh, representation of uh, highly non-frequent words. So if a word only appears one time in our whole corpus, um, when we're training our model for predictions, um, our model is only seeing one example of that word. So we would actually not generate a strong representation for that given word. Uh, so we want to do a cutoff. In this case, he selected 20. Um, it's a bit high, actually. In most cases, uh, we set, specify a cutoff of five. Um, however, that would be dependent on uh, the data, the data that you have, where um, if you're finding that uh, even uh, words with frequencies of 10 are not being represented properly, uh, you can exclude that from the vocabulary. Uh, this uh, actually, this parameter right here, the size of 300, this goes back to the prior question that was asked um, by uh, Javad, um, where he asked what the dimension of the vector space is. So when it comes to word to vec, we specify um, our vector size. Now, there is some importance of this, actually where if you think about the vector space, if our vocabulary is very large and our vector space is only five, um, and let's say our vocabulary size is, um, let's say our vocabulary size is one million. That means that we only have um, a, a, a vector space of dimension five, where we need to represent 100 words. So the, the level of information we can store in a, a dimensional space of five is very limited. So, uh, if, so we want to make sure that our dimension size is large enough so that uh, the amount of information uh, uh, the, the capacity of information uh, that we can store in that vector space is large enough to maintain, to contain our vocabulary. Uh, now, there is a thing when it comes to diminishing return um, where uh, if our dimension size is too large, um, we have an issue with sparsity. Um, where uh, some, some of that information um, may not be necessarily to represent our vocabulary size. Um, there is, has been some work conducted regarding uh, this uh, dimension vector space. Um, and um, has its, its rule of thumb, um, 200, um, is a good dimensional size when it comes to um, uh, the, the vector space. Um, once you start getting past um, 300, specifically 400, um, then uh, that's when you, when you start seeing some diminishing returns when it comes to the performance of the word embedding. Uh, so oftentimes I like to start with uh, 200 uh, primarily for computational efficiency where uh, if I can uh, reduce the size of my input, uh, then, then the dimensionality of my network could be reduced down as well. Um, so this is, is building the vocabulary table. 
So this part, all it's doing is going through the corpus and determining um, if the frequency as well as thresholds of if, for example, we want to, uh, if we want to reduce, to limit our vocabulary size to a specific uh, number. So for example, uh, if we don't care about the number of uh, frequencies in uh, how, the frequency of words, but we only want to keep, let's say, the, uh, the first 100 most frequent words. We can reduce it down to that as well, to our vocabulary. Um, so training the model. So this line of code is actually training the model. Um, again, this uh, takes a few minutes, so I'm going to exclude that. Um, rather than executing that, what I'm going to go do is uh, load in a pre-existing uh, model that I trained uh, prior. So in Gensum, if you save your uh, work to vec model uh, as a dot model, what that does is you can load it through the dot load. Now there's two forms of saving a uh, work to vec model through Gensum. One is saving the whole model. What this allows you to do is if you, uh, if you're planning to retrain your work to vec in future, uh, you would need to save it as a model uh, if you're going to perform any additional training. So this is actually key in the fact that if you have a word model and for example, you trained it on one set of corpus. Now, uh, this is actually useful uh, in some, in, this is actually very useful in NLP when we provide, when we do transfer learning. Um, we're gonna look at transfer learning uh, at, an introduction of it next week, uh, but just to provide you an overview, uh, just a quick introduction during this session is, uh, this is very useful specifically in the case of uh, when your data set that you're working with, uh, your NLP data set you're working with is not very large. Now, word to vec is very good, um, at generating high performance award embedding. However, the downside with word to vec is uh, to get very good representation of words, word representations, it needs a large volume of data. So if your data sets, let's say, is only uh, in the thousands, you only have a thousand samples of text, you're not, in most cases, you're not going to get a, a good representation for, for a word embedding. So oftentimes what we do is we train the ma, we train word to vec with a larger corpus, uh, but of similar nature. So for example, um, um, a lot of my research is in the medical field, and oftentimes, if, we're work, if I'm working with text in the medical field, the number of uh, texts I have available is very limited uh, to provide a, word in, a good word embedding representation within that domain. So a good tr trick is uh, to actually train a word embedding using wiki or a large corpus uh, like uh, a medical database of medical literature and to train the word embedding using that primarily and then uh, fine tune that word embedding using um, your limited data sets. So this is me loading that. So this is the instance where you would do the other option is to actually just um, load or and save it as keyed vectors. Now with the keyed vectors, what this does is it just saves the mapping from the word to its actual keyed vectors. It does not store the internal weights of the network. Um, so that means it cannot be retrained. 
continue retrained. So that is the loading of this. So to save your models, again, um, it's the same command. However, for the saving the model is we take the Jensen model and we just do the save command and we, we provide the extension of dot model. And for the word vector, we extract the word vector first. That's this command right here, the dot WV, and we execute the save and we save it as a keyed vector with that extension dot KV. Uh, and again, what this is doing is just doing the initialized sims. And really what this is doing is removing those weights. Um, so since we're not going to do further training, remove the weights so that when we curry um, the, the model for our vectors and perform some analysis on it, it runs a lot better and is more memory effective, efficient. Let me execute that. Now, uh, this is the good thing with Jensen when it comes to evaluating our word model. Um, we can kind of go ahead and evaluate some things that we might try to find interesting. So in this specific example, uh, we want to try to find words that are very similar to Homer. Homer is the main character in uh, the Simpsons movie. So what that does is um, provides us these words, the press, merge, tariff, and crummy as fault, sweetheart. So uh, for those with reference, uh, don't have reference to the Simpsons, Homer is a character that's predicted as being uh, lazy, uh, not the most uh, productive uh, person in society, uh, not very intelligent. Um, so that's really where these type of words are coming from. Now, if you are familiar with the term Simpsons, um, you may be asking why it's not referencing um, his correlation with key other characters that he commonly interacts with. And the reason why is this data set is particularly relating to the di to dialogues. So um, this is really, uh, the, the data set really contains of individuals uh, discussing Homer. So in their dialogue, when they describe Homer, these are the words associated to him when he's being des described. Uh, again, and this is an example. Sorry, uh, this is the original example. And so, yeah, this is the original example. And this is an example of if you were to you if you were to load uh, the worded vector where in the fact that if you load the worded vector, you do not need to access the word vector a, a dictionary within the model. Now, again, um, there is some additional analysis for the uh, other family members. So uh, you may go ahead and uh, review that, um, but so let's actually take a look at this one where um, we can kind of see how similar um, Maggie is with a baby. So Maggie is uh, actually a baby. This is a picture right here of a character in Simpsons. So we actually see that it's somewhat similar. And so th that may indicate that there's some room of improvement in our model or in the fact that in the data set, actually, uh, when people are discussing Maggie in towards their dialogue, there is not, there is some reference to her being a baby, but only 60, a little bit above 60% of the time. Uh, I'll exclude that. Uh, another thing you can do is have a list 
and kind of see, provide a list of terms and you can kind of see which one does not match. So one thing here we'll take a look at is here. So just as reference before we run this, uh, Nelson and Bart are, uh, sorry, Bart and Milhouse are best friends where Nelson is a bully. Uh, so if we were to take a look at this, the words that do not, uh, that does not match here is Nelson in the fact that um, in dialogue, there might be less uh, dialogue between Nelson Bart and Nelson and Milhouse compared to Bart and Milhouse. So this is a lot of those analysis. Now, this is one thing I want to have a look at is um, the Tisney visualization. So Tisney is a type of algorithm uh, that was gen uh, created by a student of Hinton, um, a, a student of Hinton who specializes in uh, computer vision. Um, and really what this algorithm does is it tr it, it's, it's like PCA where it reduces the dimensionality, uh, it reduces uh, the dimensionality of high dimensional data to lower dimensional space. So this is very good in the fact that, as we discussed earlier, uh, once we start getting into dimensional size of three, um, it's very hard for us to comprehend those relationships. So what we try to do is reduce it down to a lower dimension, so dimensional size of two, which is very easier, easier for us to comprehend, and analyze it through that. So that's what TISNY does. Now, TISNY is different in PCA in the fact that it doesn't gen perform uh, dimensionality reduction through linear projection, but rather it does it through local relationships of the points using, ga uh, using probability distribution via Gaussian distribution. So there's this. So there's that. We'll go ahead and uh, execute this line of code. So what this line of code is doing is, it's you pass in your model and you pass in a query term. So what it's going to do is, it's going to get the top 10 similar words of that query term and compare it with this list right here, the third parameter. So right here, uh, we actually see this is the representation of this data set. So the words that we're kind of comparing it to this green, these are just random words that uh, have been selected. And our query word is Homer. And our closest, the most similar words to Homer is actually these ones right here. Now, what's interesting is Homer actually gets in line with some of the similar words that it's closest to. However, we actually see a random word that's very quite close to Homer. Now, the reason why this is, is the fact that it's not necessarily that our representation is wrong, as well as why Apu doesn't appear uh, within the similarity realm when we query Homer is the fact that Tisney uh, is performing uh, is performing dimensioning reduction through an optimization embedding using gradient descent. So there is some learning being involved there and being uh, conducted there uh, when it's trying to reduce the dimensionality from high to low and the fact that uh, this itself is learning some weights to kind of go from the high dimensionality to the low dimensionality. So one thing I caution about when working with TISNY is TISNY isn't a concrete evaluation metric um, in the fact that if you see very good results in it, it might it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the model is perfect, as well as if you if you're generating a very poorly results, it might not necessarily mean that your model is 
uh, not working correctly. In some cases, it's your model is working correctly. However, uh, the the dimension in hour reduction from high to low isn't as optimized when uh, it's not really optimized in the TISNY, which is showing you discrepancy in your visualization results. Uh, so there's that. Um, some other things uh, that shows up here is interesting. If we look at uh, Maggie and we compare the most dissimilar uh, words to uh, Maggie, we actually see a nice uh, clustering here, which indicate that there is good word representation that's happening. Where Maggie is being really clustered to her close terms um, and being separated by her least similar words, and we can easily distinguish between those two entries. Um, so there's that. There this is the final of this notebook. Um, next week, we'll actually look at uh, uh, transferring these word embeddings towards our deep neural network model. Um, and uh, specifically, I held off in it in the fact that uh, we haven't covered this, which, which we will be covering uh, next week which is primary, which we can uh, transfer that word embedding nicely within these RNN structures. Um, any questions before we close off? Uh, nope, okay. Um, before we close off, actually, within the participation tab, uh, within the participation, um, I believe there's an option for individual, there is a, a button to raise hand. I would just like to have an uh, indication of how many individuals are uh, interested in material of the application of applying CNN type models to NLP problems. So if you're interested, please raise your hands. And if there's enough individuals, I will prepare something. Okay, I think there's a significant amount of people interested in it. Okay, um, so I think there's enough people interested in it. So what I'll do is um, I will modify next week's session slightly uh, to also uh, provide an overview of how that's done uh, through uh, CNN. Um, I won't, I, I won't go through the coding aspects of it. Um, however, if you're familiar with uh, CNN, it should be very straightforward. It's really how you prepare uh, the text uh, for the CNN. However, the structure of the data, uh, the structure of the architecture for CNN is uh, identical. There is just some steps in preparing uh, the uh, CNN um, and how we feed it in. Okay, so if there's nothing else, if there's no other questions, um, I any if Eunice, if you want to have any closing remarks. Uh, no, thank you so much. It was a very interesting uh, talk, especially the Simpson part. I really liked it. Um, as always, I would I will share the presentation as well as the video recording of the this session for everyone. And uh, if there's nothing else, I will hope you all to see you all next week as well. Yes. Oh, actually, one prior note that I have uh, regarding. Uh, the, the notebook is, um, majority of the notebook has been already uh, conducted in the Kaggle. Uh, one thing I would recommend um, is really um, 
to make a copy of this notebook and play around with it. Uh, but instead of using the Simpsons data set, um, uh, apply um, the the movie review data set that uh, we were uh, doing last week. And the way you do that is just go to add data sets and search up that specific data set. Um, and then you can load it in, change just the name when you're loading the pandas, when you're loading in the data set uh, right here. Um, I think you don't see your screen anymore. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, so again, sorry about that. So to add the data set, you just go to add data and then go to data sets, the search for the, uh, the movie sentiment. Um, I think it's the IMDb one. Uh, or the Yelp. Um, but you can test it out with this one as well. Um, and then uh, click add, and then uh, just change the path of the file that you are, rather than the Simpsons data set, it would be the movie data set. Okay. Um, so again, thank you for everybody. Okay, um, so thank you all and um, see you all next week. Thank you, thank you Alex, bye.